Good morning, everybody. Most of you know me. For the ones who don't know, you will know in a <laughs> couple of minutes. Uh, I might have to skip some slides because I see we are a bit late, so I want to focus on the key uh, messages. I've been asked to uh, do a presentation uh, with some kind of uh, key moments that made the drug consumption possible, and with message I can bring you that you will bring further in your uh, country of origin. Uh, before we start, as you can see, uh, this is checklist part one. Users welcome, if I say it, it's because it's part of a campaign, nothing about us without us. So when we talk about drug consumption room or anything else related to drug use, we have to include the users. Um, as you can see, this is uh, a repetition of uh, what I'm doing at the moment. I'm a coordinator of a drug consumption room, one of the three drug consumption rooms in Amsterdam. I work for the Correlation Network Project Officer. I am the facilitator of the International Network of Drug Consumption Room, which I recommend all of you to visit on the internet, where you have all kind of documents that you may find useful for promotion of the drug consumption room. And uh, until the end of the year, I'm also a European Forum Urban Security External Advisor to try to promote the establishment of new drug consumption rooms in places where they do exist and we do the monitoring and places where they do not exist. Now, um, to start with the ENDCR, uh, I'm going to ask a simple question. Would you jump from a plane without a parachute? No. Probably not. And if I say that, it's because that's a quote of the ENDCR. Um, research to prove that it's safer to inject drug in a drug consumption room is like proving that it's safer to jump from a plane without a parachute. It's really stupid. Drug consumption room works. <laughs> now, a drug consumption room, a uh, simple definition, uh, it's a place where people can use their drug under supervision, uh, they are safe, in a safe environment, and the main goals of a drug consumption room everywhere in the world, in any other drug consumption room, are prevention of overdose, uh, drug related death, prevention of blood transmitted disease, mainly hepatitis C and HIV, and limitation of public nuisance. As you understand, I come from a very uh, particular place, Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, where uh, decriminalization has been uh, put in place for many years, let's say from 1986. Um, and what is in fact a drug consumption room in the Netherlands? For me, as a citizen of Amsterdam, I can maybe have cocaine, heroin at home, I finish work, I pick up my kids from school or from kindergarten, I cook for me and my wife, and when everybody's sleeping, I'm shooting heroin watching TV. That's my drug consumption room. It's my safe zone, it's legal for me to use in my house, um, but there are many people who don't have a house, and the drug consumption room is designed for them. It's for marginalized users, homeless people. So what we do, we recreate a living room for homeless people, and they are allowed to use drugs, and they are safe. So it's a very simple thing, finally, a drug consumption room. It seems simple for me, because I come from a place where decriminalization has been put in place a long time ago, and is widely accepted. There are various models of drug consumption rooms, all of them being um, a semi living room. Uh, here I put two of the, uh, four of the model, but there are some we might think to be invented. Um, there are integrated drug consumption room. Uh, those are facilities where you don't have just a drug consumption room, but it's associated service, maybe it's part of a big uh, dropping center, maybe you have a night shelter. Maybe there is methadone distribution, maybe there is a doctor on site. It's a complete setting uh, taking care of the whole drug uh, use uh, for marginalized people. As a standalone or specialized model is really what it means. It's just purely a drug consumption room. Uh, without specifically additional uh, associated service, sometimes methadone distribution, sometimes basic uh, service, low threshold like shower and food, but it's really uh, focusing on having a place to use. That's it. Uh, we have the mobile unit. Uh, this is a picture of the bus in Copenhagen, but you have uh, more and more of the mobile units starting to pop up since uh, it's a very efficient model to reach population which is moving. One day uh, the city is on the east side of the city, one day is on the west side. Uh, sometimes you have more sex workers on, on a part of the city and you have to adapt the route, you can change the opening hours. 
it's a very dynamic uh, kind of drug consumption room. And uh, we have also a housing facility with drug consumption room. This is a model which I really like. It's uh, tackling two problems, housing first and drug using. So in the Netherlands, we start to see uh, this model becoming more popular, not yet <coughs> taking over the rest of the drug consumption room, but it is a very um, uh, efficient model to tackle housing. Because in fact, uh, a lot of drug use is a response to stress. We know that. So uh, looking for a place to sleep at night is an enormous amount of stress. And how do we respond to stress when we have no place to sleep? Uh, we use more drugs. So uh, the fact that it's tackling and housing and drug using, it's uh, for us a very positive uh, future development of the drug consumption room. All of those models have pros and cons. I will just mention a couple of them. For the integrated facilities, the, the, the pros is you have everything on site. So you're safe, you have a doctor, you have a low threshold, you can take a shower, you can eventually sleep in a night shelter. It's fine, but the negative aspect could be that it's a big structure in city center and it can eventually bring to what we call the honeypot effect. And the honeypot effect, that means that the whole scene will move around, in and around the facility. So it's not always the best uh, model to sell to a city. Uh, the mobile unit, uh, the pro, like I said, flexible, possible to adapt the route, opening hours, uh, negative aspect of it, or the cons, is it's very small. It's maximum one or two users at a time, um, and everybody who is operating this site needs a driving license, so it might uh, occasion, occasion some cost for the organization who wants to create this uh, model. For the standalone uh, model, uh, the pros is that it's really, like I explained, a living room where people can use drugs and are safe. Uh, the cons is that eventually uh, it's made for a small amount of users and then the cost related is very high. The professionality is, is still guaranteed, the same uh, standard of quality. And then for, let's say, 8 to 12 users, suddenly the cost per user is extremely high. That could be a difficulty to create in 2019. So this is pretty much a model which was very popular in, let's say, 2000, 2010 in Germany, some of them in Switzerland, related, uh, and in the Netherlands, most of the users were affiliated to the postcode next to this facility. It's really to avoid the honeypot effect. So, pros and cons in both situations. I mentioned here overdose prevention site. Since it's included in the ENDCR uh, mapping, we still register all the overdose prevention site, even if it's not the model we do like to promote, because it's a crisis response, and it's not a structural long-term response. So we don't know what it will become. I'm talking now about Canada. Please don't extrapolate too much on this. The future... Uh, will tell us what the overdose prevention site will become. Will they stay like this? Will they become drug consumption room with structural funding? Everything has to be discovered. We are in a very interesting time in terms of drug consumption. I uh, made a little short summary of the history that led to the establishment of drug consumption room and where we are today. So as you can see in the 70s, that was a very particular time. It was uh, after the May 68 in France, the Woodstock in, in America. <laughs> but the Vietnam War veterans decided not to return to, to the States, but they came to Denmark, to the Netherlands. Uh, and that was the beginning of what we used to call the heroin epidemic. That means that in Europe there was a lot of heroin. Um, bringing uh, heroin, lots of street using, uh, we started to have the automatic HIV testing in prison in 1983 in Switzerland. We realized very quick after this uh, start of the testing HIV for prisoners that the HIV was getting really um, a high percentage among the drug using population, a lot of overdose um, deaths, and major uh, open drug scene. I don't know if you have seen documentaries about the Splatspitz or the Latin in Zurich where there was about 30,000 uh, drug injectors per day in a disaffected train station. Uh, in Amsterdam, I don't know exactly, there was about 30,000 drug users, injectors, in the beginning of the 80s, in Amsterdam alone. Now we are at 30,000 injectors in the Netherlands. So that tells you that it's changed. Um, 
the creation of the very first drug consumption law in the world was in 1986 in Switzerland. Possible because in 1986 Switzerland decided to decriminalize the personal drug, drug use. In the 90s, a uh, lot of users decided to experiment and continue to experiment with heroin, with other drug cocaine, and MDMA uh, in search of sex, drug, and rock and roll. There was not much sex and not much rock and roll in the other drugs. And uh, this led to Germany and Holland following the Swiss model uh, decriminalization and creation of the very first drug consumption rule. From 1988 till last year, there, is been, there has been a growing amount of countries interested in creating drug consumption rule. Um, there was eight, let's say, countries with more and more drug consumption rule, plus Canada and Australia. And today, there are more and more countries joining the club. So, uh, this is a map that you can find on our website. It's updated uh, regularly, which means every time a drug consumption room closes, we remove it. Every time it's open, we open it. You click on any of them, you have the opening hours, a contact person. So it's a very uh, dynamic map, and it's constantly, we are constantly adding new dots on it. As you can see, the first wave was Switzerland, Germany, Netherlands, Luxembourg, Denmark, Spain, Canada, Australia. Uh, from 2000, let's say, then till today, it's France, Norway, Portugal this year, congratulations, uh, Mexico, which closed but will probably reopen, and Belgium, congratulations Belgium. Now, uh, the, future, <laughs> the future might be bright or not, we'll see, uh, there is a big hope about Ireland, they are just waiting for the last uh, accreditation from the government, they have a project very uh, structured, they have the site, they have the team, they have had all the training, they just need a, a politician with balls. Now, uh, the UK, let's forget about it. As long as the Brexit is going on, there is nothing going to happen. Sorry, UK. Scotland, same story. Brexit first, and then what? Independence or not? But they are ready. Glasgow is ready to open yesterday. Uh, Finland, Iceland, Slovenia, Romania. I put those names because those are little signals that I get via the different conference I have or different partners I have. They give me some signals like <coughs> somebody from Carousel in Romania said, you know, we will never talk about it, but one day we will open and we will let you know. Okay, fine. If that's how it works. For some people, it's years of advocacy at the political level, some it's at the local level, and uh, whatever model they choose for me, as long as one open, one drug consumption room more open, my job is done. Um, how come I've been asked by uh, the organizer today to describe the key moments and key messages that made the establishment of the drug consumption room possible? And this is what I came up to. In the 90s, in the Netherlands, the fact that the drug consumption room were created, accepted, it was an initiative actually from the police. And the police had enough to arrest people now at 12 o'clock and people who were just using drugs in the street, which was still crime, and they were released the next day because in fact it was not a crime to use, it was a crime to possess. That's the whole loophole in the decriminalization law. Police had enough to have only one response, the prohibition. Arresting people, putting them in prison. They wanted to find a third way. There was or they had to close their eyes or they had to arrest people. And the fact that they heard about drug consumption room in Switzerland, that they wanted to find a solution which was more pragmatic than just a strict uh, repression approach, uh, in a coalition with the city and the care workers and for sure the union of users, which at the time was strong, uh, that made it possible for the Netherlands to open the first drug consumption room. Same story, in parallel, we from the caregiver of the care sector, uh, we were more concerned about health, about saving life, about the HIV epidemic. Uh, and this has been fluctuating through the years. Uh, the last 20 years, what we've seen is that when people talk about drug consumption room, some of them are very keen on health, saving life. But to sell the drug consumption room to your city, some other has been talking a lot more about public nuisance because that's what people, taxpayers, want. 
Everybody wants to help a user or homeless, but not in their street, not in their neighborhood. When we talk, when we talk about limitation of public reasons, suddenly people get a it ring a bell in their brain. So fine for me if you use the healthcare or if you use the public reasons to achieve the goal of establishing a drug consumption, fine. It depends to who you're talking to. When I talk to a convinced audience like you, I talk with my heart. But when I talk to politicians or police or a union of story of owners, I use my wallet. Then I use public reasons, reduction of cost, etc. Uh, positive experience and key messages. It has to be a win-win for the community, for the users, for the caregivers, for the police, and so on. And uh, I like to say that we have to change the narrative of, of uh, we against them, but we means we are all in it together. And we work together, not but. So um, this is very important. I'm training my team, I'm training the PR to use this uh, vocabulary to make sure that it's an including, including language, including the users, including the workers. Two very important key messages that I found out recently and that you can use for advocacy when you talk about drug consumption. In Canada, the habitants of the neighborhood of the drug consumption room feel safer since there is a drug consumption room. And in fact, it's because there is more police presence before opening time, at closing time. So the fact that you have a visible police officer in a uniform, people feel safe. They are not safer, don't, don't get me wrong. But they feel safer. So that's a, some message that we can use you will be safer in your neighborhood if there is a drug consumption room. The other part is in France, for example, the drug consumption room has not been uh, established just as an independent services. It's part of an urbanism plan. Okay, we're going to create a drug consumption room, but at the same time we're going to renovate the, the park and we're going to create a, um, a playground for children and we're going to uh, build a new parking lot, etc., etc. So the whole neighborhood is getting picked up. It's not only just yeah, give service for users because taxpayers don't understand that yeah, those users get everything and we need a new uh, kindergarten uh, or we need a new uh, playground, but they never have it. So you have to satisfy the we. We, the whole community. Uh, this is a kind of summary of ins and outs. That means the win-win situation. Benefit to the society, benefit to the users. For the users, it's access to hygienic and clean and safe environment, uh, healthcare, access to social services, etc. For the society, for sure, when we decrease the HIV uh, rate among the drug users, we, we decrease it in the general public. We, drug users or not, uh, we interact with the general public constantly, so we have sex with uh, heterosexual non users, etc. etc. So, as soon as there is an impact on the health, positive impact for the users, there is a positive impact for the general public, and the other way around. I also notice long-term cost of healthcare. The more abscess you can pre prevent, the less care. Okay, fine, so I'm going to skip another slide because I have five minutes. Um, how do we work? This is the drug consumption room I'm facilitating. We are open seven days a week. There is no day off, there is no break for drug users, so 365 days a year. Uh, you have to be a long-term drug user, 18 years old plus, and uh, homeless. Homeless, that doesn't mean that you don't live somewhere, in a house, on a boat, etc. But you don't have a registered address that doesn't give you access to rights. Um, we have a ratio of one worker for 18 clients. Uh, all staff members are trained in first aid and uh, we get specific training on overdose. Uh, like I said, I work in an integrated facility. One of the models I present, so we have a lot of different department of it, and we work with many partners in prevention, uh, medical care, therapy, etc. Et Good practice. The rule is a tool. This is one of my favorites because that's what I'm uh, trying to work to. Um, I can have two extra minutes. Cool. So I'm going to start to talk about uh, Lord of the Fly. The rules of a drug consumption room, they are based on safety, hygiene, stress-free. When I started to work in a drug consumption room in 2003, there was a whole list, a contract that the users had to sign, a whole list of not to do. I will not bring a friend, I will not deal inside the user's room, I will not do this, I will not do that. Every year we have the meeting with the users and the staff and we say, are you satisfied with the service? What do you think we can change? And every time the discussion was turning to say, we want more rules. 
right? When you want more rooms, yeah, we should not bring animals. We should not hang around the building before and after closing time. So after two years and two of those meetings, one uh, A4 page was not enough. <laughs> and I said, we are going the wrong direction, guys. We are like reproducing the Lord of the Fly story. Lord of the Fly story, uh, School of Somerville, at the end of the anti-psychiatry movement, they tried to put kids in school, and the teacher were observing what kids would decide as ruling and consequence of breaching the rules. And finally, the experience had to stop after one year because they realized that the setting of rules was much too strict and the consequence of breaching them were much too cruel. And that's exactly what was going on in the drug consumption room. So I said, we're going to scrap the contract. I destroyed the contract and I said, now we're going to go back to what is the basic of a drug consumption room. And the clients who come to our facilities, they sign a contract which is three lines. I will behave in accordance to the harm reduction principle and I will use inside the drug consumption room respecting the safety, the hygiene and the stress free. And that's it. And that makes our job so easy. Because as you can understand, when you have a whole set of rules, I'm going to be constantly discussing with this client, yeah, show me where is the rule, why I'm not allowed, where is it written, etc. I don't want to have those discussions. I'm here to facilitate safe hygienic use. So let's imagine this lady come inside and she put a knife on the table. No, a knife, it's not safe and it brings a lot of stress. If you are starting, gentlemen, to start to deal drugs in our drug consumption room, sorry, it's not safe and it's bringing a lot of stress. If you bring a dog inside a drug consumption room, sorry, a drug consumption room is like a medical facility, like a hospital, you don't bring a dog in the operation block. So uh, that's how we work. As you understand, this is another uh, Slide, I found a picture of a non-existing drug consumption room anymore in the Netherlands, but this was their basic rule. It fits on uh, three, six points. Maximum one hour inside, you take drug and you, use, uh, you know the risk you take. Um, you are not allowed to share, deal, exchange drugs. If you have a knife, put it in the locker. You may not take your coffee inside and you clean after yourself. That's it. It's like a living room. I mean, if you have teenagers, it's a bit difficult to have a night in a living room, but still, that's how it works. <laughs> outcomes. Um, outcomes. Uh, one of the key outcomes is the sure uh, hepatitis C and especially the HIV uh, reduction. As you can see, this uh, table from the HIV monitoring uh, national service in the Netherlands uh, from. 4% around 2008, we are reaching now 0.001% among the registered injectors of the Netherlands. The last 10 years in Amsterdam, there was one proven contamination among the registered drug users. So uh, it works. It works. Um, one of the outcomes, and I will uh, keep it short about the rest, is that we realized part of, yeah, part of the overdose uh, monitoring services in Europe that the DCR is one of the few facilities where we have a perfect overview of non-lethal and uh, there is no lethal incident, but non-lethal uh, incidents, and we can report that very well. But all the non-lethal incidents that means are treated on site, and we prevent a lot of death. So that's working. Um, as you understand, we work on both quality of the drug users, quality of the neighborhood. Now, I've been asked to talk about the finance, because that's the key. Money is uh, money talks. Uh, I didn't want to bring a price. I can tell you how much it costs to operate a drug consumption in Amsterdam, but you will never be able to put it in your context. I don't know what is the salary scale of a nurse in Lithuania. I don't know what is the rent per meter square in Greece. So this would make no sense, but this is pretty much the exploitation cost compared to the salary cost. Salary related is the most important. And the last uh, checklist, I would advise if you are trying to plan eventually to put this on the agenda, locally or nationally, try to create a PR department who is working on transparency, but who is very aware of what to say to who. Uh, a neighborhood commission is very important. In the Netherlands, every drug consumption room is part of the neighborhood commission. Uh, start small and increase, or start, start big and decrease, depending on what you get from your local government. 
adapt to the reality of the drug scene. Like I said, if you have a very uh, uh, spread drug scene, you might choose the mobile unit. If you have a concentrated drug scene in city center, you might like to choose for an integrated model. Involve the user in the daily routine. Uh, find a PR strategies. Peer work, always interesting because they are also uh, encouraged to give feedback to the quality of the service and we can improve the service constantly, it's a uh, moving thing. Voila, this is a slide about what is a neighborhood commission and this is make our job so much more easy because I don't have to face the city, the city is part of it. I don't have to face the police, the police is involved into the neighborhood commission. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I put those two uh, pictures because that's interesting. British press sometime and you don't know on which foot you have to dance. I let you think about it and I let more room for discussion. Thank you very much.